All right, we will go ahead and get started. Welcome, everybody. My name is Rob Connor, a professor here in uh, civil engineering, and I have the distinct pleasure of announcing uh, our uh, Dennis and Leslie drag lecture for our spring semester in 2024. We want to acknowledge Dennis, of course, and his generosity to make this lecture happen. Uh, it's a great opportunity we have to bring in great speakers like we have today. He's assured me he'll do a great job. No, he'll do a great job. Uh, we have Dr. Tom Murphy with us. Uh, from Majeski and Masters. And I'm going to read his title here because this is one of those big titles. Senior Vice President and Chief Technical Officer Majeski and Masters. Now this is for the National Bridge Group. And I have to say on a personal note, you know, I'm, I'm reading what he wrote here and he really undersold himself because I've had the privilege of 20, 25 years now, I think I've known Tom and worked with him on different things. And Tom is one of those guys who, I, I'll joke, like annoys me, right? Because he's good at all different things, right? I have my little area, but he is good at, at all kinds of things. But in the bridge world, for those of you who are, if you run in that crowd or will run in that crowd, his name is one that's kind of synonymous with what we do, especially in getting research in particular. He does research and CHRP projects, but getting it into the code and then working with other people like myself, Professor Ramirez, right? Those of us who do research like this, helping us figure out how to get what we do incorporated into the code. Now, Majeski Masters has a long history with that. Tom is the guy who is at every meeting that I'm ever at. Uh, related to specifications, helping get that in. Now, I'm at the steel meetings, but he does that other material, concrete occasionally, right? He's working with Professor Frosch on if you've seen the big bird getting tested at Bowen, right? It's all going to move that research into the specifications. But it's not just on the design side, right? Active with the evaluation committees for AASHTO, failure investigations, we've had the opportunity, I guess, also to work on a few failures together. Um, and so if you look at this little write up, it undersells because he is one of the go-to guys for our industry and bridges to ask questions, to get questions answered, whether it's on the spec, behavior, speed dial of Federal Highway, and different DOTs when they need to bring in somebody who really knows their stuff. Tom's the go-to guy. So we're really fortunate to have him here with us today to, to talk about a topic that's kind of near and dear to his heart. I know we talked about it last night a little bit. The idea of when you're a structural engineer thinking through behavior, and looking through failures to understand behavior better and kind of looking to the past to look forward and stuff. So he's a very good speaker and has a lot of great experience. And the last little part is, real him when you're done, when he's done, ask a lot of questions. And we've had a lot of great speakers come in for the, for the drag lecture. But I think Tom is going to hold a record. We bring people in from around the country and they fly in. Tom flew in. But Tom literally flew in. I picked him up at the Purdue airport. He owns his own plane. Oh. And he went last night. I'm standing there. He taxis in, comes over. I help him button up the plane, and that was cool. <laughs> so uh, he's going to fly back out, I think, tomorrow morning, depending on the weather, maybe earlier or later. But with uh, all that being said, let's give him a warm for you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, and Thank you, Dennis, for supporting this lecture and for inviting me here today. Um, so my goal here is to get through a description of what exactly is a structural behaviorist and why you might want to become one. Um, so let's get started. I think it's working. Okay, a note before we begin, though. Um, so the sort of basic thesis of this talk is, is mine and mine alone. So if you don't like it, then you can blame me. Um, don't blame anybody else. Uh, however, uh, most of what I'll be talking about are all, is all work that uh, I've done at Majeski and Masters with a number of very many highly talented engineers. Uh, and this is very much uh, a group effort. Um, you know, major bridge projects, like we'll be talking about a little bit, involve very large teams of, of expertise, of, of experts. And really, no one person should ever take credit for for these uh, combined efforts. So uh, don't think I did all this myself because that's far from the truth. So what is a structural behaviorist, uh, if we want to start off in that direction? Um, structural engineers, uh, as you probably know, right, we focus on analyzing structures to determine the load effects, and then we design the components for those calculated loads of load effects. Um, sometimes we'll um, sort of separate ourselves in between analysts, people who do mostly analysis, uh, and designers, people who detail and and size uh, plates and rebar uh, and concrete sections. But um, to me, I think the, the far more useful uh, differentiation is between process versus behavior. And what I mean by that is um, a lot of what we do as bridge designers uh, is, is kind of standardized, right? So uh, if you're designing um, a structure, an overpass structure, there, there are thousands like it around. Uh, 
Uh, and so it's really the process that we go through. Um, you may, you know, the, the, the uh, extent of your structural analysis uh, might be quite limited. You're, you're doing something that's very similar to what's been done before. And you really don't necessarily have to think a whole lot about structural behavior. Um, and so your, the skill sets that you, you sort of develop as a student may not always get fully uh, utilized uh, when you get into design. Um, you know, there are standardized analysis and design software that you can apply. It's very efficient, it's very economical, um, but you really don't necessarily need to know a whole lot to use that. So, um, you know, you input the span length and the girder spacing and the, what depth you want, uh, and out, out will come your design cross-sections, whether it's steel or concrete. Um, and you really don't have to think a whole lot about that in order to make it happen. And so you can, uh, as a structural engineer, you can sort of get um, lulled into this process of design, uh, focusing on, on that, you know, putting your design drawings together, um, doesn't have a lot to do with structural behavior a lot of the time. Uh, one of my colleagues will quote a couple of times here, uh, Dr. Phil Ritchie, 90% um, of design is geometry, right? <coughs> we spend most of our time on um, worrying about how long the rebar should be, where the bends should be so that it fits in the deck, let's say. Um, you know, barriers, joints, bearings, um, roadway geometrics across the bridge, all of these things are, are items of design um, that impact our design drawings, but really have nothing to do with structural behavior. Um, but they are very important, and you got to get them right, because if you, you know, make a, a mistake on these things, it can cost uh, a lot of, cause a lot of problems and cost a lot of money. So how much of design is really related to structural behavior? Um, I think you could probably develop a full bridge design with essentially no direct consideration of actual structural behavior especially if it's a standardized design, you're picking your beams out of a table, let's say. Um, and, you know, depending on, on what kind of projects you work on, you may be able to go an entire career without really ever having to get deeply into structural behavior uh, in your design process, uh, which can be a, a bad thing. Um, so what is a structural behaviorist? Well, that would be the opposite of that. And instead, someone who's more focused on the actual behavior of the structure. Um, internalize the concepts of stiffness of load and deflection, um, load paths, you know, as a designer we're always thinking about load paths, um, how the bridge is going to respond to live load, to wind loads, to temperature. Um, structural behaviors to someone who sort of thinks in terms of free body diagrams, um, able to uh, conceptualize a portion of the structure and sort of evaluate what kind of loads are affecting it uh, and how it's going to behave uh, and, and use that then to uh, go and design. Um, a structural behaviorist would be somebody who understands material behavior, including beyond cracking, beyond the inelastic, beyond the elastic limits uh, of materials, because sometimes you need to um, go there as a designer. Um, so what are the roadblocks to getting to this uh, position of being a sort of a behaviorist? Well, uh, the design equations that we use uh, are sometimes very disconnected from behavior. So uh, on the right there are sort of the series of equations that you need to go through. Well, we'll be changing them shortly, but some series of equations to go through for design for uh, shear and reinforced and pre-stressed concrete. Um, and you know, looking at those, it's not intuitive exactly what they mean or how they were derived or how they really um, tie into the behavior of the structure. You know, look at all the variables, there are sub-variables, there are sub-sub-variables. Um, you know, if you're going to do this efficiently, you're going to put this into a spreadsheet. If you're not using a canned piece of software, um, you're going to put your inputs at the top and out, out the bottom will come your reinforcing spacing. Um, so that doesn't really give you a good feel for what all that means uh, a lot of times. So certainly the way we, the way we codify our design process can, can be a hindrance to this. Um, analysis software. Uh, is this a help or is this a hindrance to really understanding structural behavior? Um, you know, today, it has never been easier to analyze an extremely complex structure. And uh, in the same vein, it's never been easier to come up with the wrong answer, right? We can, we can very quickly develop a model that will give us the incorrect results. Uh, and so trying to figure out what's right and what's wrong um, in analysis is just as hard as it's ever been. And I might argue that it's uh, even harder. Um, so as a, on the plus side, right, you can use analysis as a tool to help understand. Um, you, Graphical display of displaced shapes is great. Uh, it really helps give a feel for how the structure is behaving, how it's responding to load. Um, you can quickly incorporate changes uh, to the stiffness of your load path or different load paths and, and see the results, um, you know, shell elements, solid elements. 
uh, interface elements, things that uh, allow us to analyze uh, behaviors that we could only guess at previously. I mean, it's a great day to be, it's a great year to be a structural engineer uh, compared to in past where we had to um, try and deal with complex behaviors and really couldn't analyze them. Now we can. Um, but on the other hand, um, there are a lot of pitfalls. Uh, with all this power uh, is the opportunity for, for using it incorrectly. Um, and it takes the form of a, a different approaches here. So um, you may end up using an oversimplified model for what's really complex behavior. An example of that would be a skewed girder bridge, um, which can have relatively complex behavior. If you try and just use a simple beamline analysis for that, um, you're going to miss the behavior of a, uh, that the skew is, is incorporating. Um, on the other hand, using overcomplicated analyses for what could be a very simple analysis um, can really block your understanding of the structure. Um, you know, axial dead load forces in a truss. That's something you can do by hand um, and relatively quickly. Um, but yet, some folks might create a 3D finite element analysis program uh, to get something that you could calculate in five minutes by hand. Um, so the key here is not to let the model stand in the way of the structural behavior. Um, use the simplest approach that captures the behavior that you're interested in, and no more complex than that. Um, because it's your job to really understand what the software is saying. It's not the software's job to give you the right answer. Uh, it's your responsibility is yours. Uh, so talking a little bit about the appropriate level of analysis for the structure, um, and here's an example uh, for a suspension bridge. Uh, cable state bridges and suspension bridges under their dead load states um, are statically determinate structures. They're designed to be statically determinate for the most part. Um, so this is the only equation I'll get into any depth in. Uh, and there's a classic equation for suspension bridges. And H is the horizontal component of, uh, of the force in the cable. And that's just equal to the dead load or the load um, per unit length along the bridge. Uh, the main span squared divided by the sag of the cable. So it's a really simple equation. Uh, very powerful. Uh, so for just about any suspension bridge uh, that you've ever seen, uh, all you need to know is the span length, the cable sag, and the dead load per foot, and you know the force in the cable essentially at any location. Um, and knowing that, you know the hanger forces, you can define essentially the whole dead load stress state of what is really a complex structure, um, but very simply. And that's because we design it so that there's no bending moments uh, in the stiffening truss under dead load. Um, if you try and, and do that analysis using um, uh, an FEA or, or a stiffness model, um, you can iterate forever and not quite get there, uh, just because it's hard to get a model um, to coalesce at those dead load forces, because you have to pre-stress the cables and pre-stress the suspenders, and it gets really complicated. Um, you can do it, obviously, um, but it's just a whole lot simpler to do that one by hand and get the right answer than to spend all that time uh, in a model if, if that's what you're after. And so you know, that's an example of if what you want is the dead load force in your suspension bridge cable, um, use the level of analysis that's appropriate to it. Um, looking at some other examples here, uh, more in terms of design, uh, when you're designing an arch uh, bridge, uh, determining the shape of that arch uh, is an important aspect of the design. Um, and uh, we're going to get into how that matters. Uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about suspension bridge joints um, and how to design those. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about an example with some nonlinear material properties uh, in the I-74 arches. Um, so for arches, they carry loads through their geometry, much like a suspension bridge. So it's the actual uh, geometric arrangement of the arch that defines what the loads are in the arch. It defines the uh, axial load in the arch, and it defines the moments in the arch. Um, an arch is really an upside down cable. Um, so, you know, if you think of a cable and you hang loads on it, the cable is going to shift and move. The loads are going to shift around until it finds equilibrium. Um, that's what's shown uh, on the bottom left hand corner. Uh, and the arch is the same thing. You can flip that upside down uh, and you get to the same uh, conclusion. It's the shape of the arch that determines the moments in the arch. So finding uh, the shape that sort of minimizes the moments becomes a key. Um, and this is not just in arches, uh, this is uh, uh, Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, um, which is the, still under construction, it's a cathedral. Um, and that has been designed using a tension model on the left. This is essentially the cathedral upside down with loads hung uh, appropriate to the weights of all the um, masonry. And then the geometry uh, of that model is measured and that's how they determined the geometry of the stone columns uh, that they're building. So the same idea here in that um, Tension and compression are opposites of each other. 
So it, it follows from that that there's really one shape uh, for an arch that minimizes the moments in that arch for any given loading. Um, that's called the funicular polygon. Uh, those images that you saw were from a textbook from the a late 1800s, um, where they understood that concept quite well. Um, and it's been around since then. What was shown was a graphical method for solving that. You can use other methods to do that. Uh, but the key here is the concept. Um, and usually what we do is we optimize the arch shape uh, for the dead load condition. Uh, especially for longer span bridges, dead load dominates the loading on the bridge. Um, and that's what we want to optimize it for. Uh, so for a uniform load, that ends up being a parabola. If you sort of go through and do the math, you end up with a parabolic shape for that. Uh, and so th that's something, again, that you can do by hand or in a spreadsheet, um, where it would be very difficult to sort of find the optimum shape using a computer program. You could do that, uh, but you can do it a whole lot quicker if, as long as you understand some of these key uh, aspects of behavior. So for um, the I-74 arches, which are shown here, this is a bridge over the Mississippi that opened about a year and a half ago. Uh, it's approximately 800 foot span. Um, the hangers are relatively closely spaced. And so that ends up being um, loading the arch relatively uniformly. So the um, shape of the arch that was chosen was a parabola. And uh, the red uh, square there is um, an uh, extract from the design drawings. So we've got the parabolic shape of the arch uh, described uh, there. And that's what they ended up building. Um, but that's not always the best case. So uh, this is um, the Hawk Falls Arch Bridge in northeastern Pennsylvania that's currently under construction. It's about a 465 foot span uh, in a gorge. Um, in this case, uh, you'll notice that the deck is on top of the arch and there's only a few columns uh, that load the arch. So it's a, a different loading situation than the I-74 arches. Um, instead of a uniform load, now we've got sort of these point loads uh, being applied to the arch. So that results in a, a somewhat more complicated straight shape and it's hard to tell from the, the excerpt of the design drawing here, but um, there are kinks at every column location. So uh, each of the vertical lines is where a column is. Uh, we've got a, a constant radius curve that comes up, and then there's a kink here, and a different radius, and another kink. Uh, and that shape was driven by the applied loadings. And the goal was to minimize the induced dead load moments in the arch rib, reduce the amount of steel required, and result in an optimum design. Uh, moving on a little bit to um, some other aspects of, of design that you kind of need to know behavior for. Uh, we'll look at a suspension bridge, uh, not this particular one, uh, but uh, a bridge not too far from here. Um, and su suspension bridges just behave differently. They're um, not like a girder bridge. Um, they're really not like an arch bridge either. Uh, they have their own quirks. Um, and you kind of need to know that um, while you're dealing with one of these. Um, so the project here was to redeck a suspension bridge, put a new deck on it, um, and um, it has expansion joints at the towers. And uh, the consultant who was doing the work um, treated it as, the, as you would a girder bridge. So they sized the expansion joint movement, how, much, uh, how large the joint would need to be, just based on the temperature changes and the span length. Gives you the, the, the movement range for a girder bridge. Um, but suspension bridges are different, um, and when you apply a vertical load to a suspension bridge. Uh, it obviously moves vertically, um, as shown here, but it also moves longitudinally. Um, so a blow up of the left hand side shows this. Again, just vertical loads have been applied, but because the cable is changing its geometry to carry the loads, it ends up moving longitudinally. Uh, and so the expansion joint needs to be sized not just for the temperature change, but also for the physical movement of the bridge when loads get applied. And so they needed to redesign their expansion joint uh, for that. Uh, the last example here uh, on the design side uh, relates to um, a specific connection in the I-74 arches. Um, so this is a, um, this is a, we'll be able to see here shortly, uh, a steel basket handle arch uh, that has fixed ended connections. So the steel arch is uh, rigidly connected to the concrete substructure to carry moments through that. And in order to do that, it needed some high strength pre-stressed anchor bolts uh, to make that connection. Um, these anchor bolts would not be replaceable. I suppose maybe you could do it uh, with some heroic measures, but it would be very messy. Um, so they need to be corrosion resistant. So that led us uh, down a path of looking for a material that would allow us to connect um, the ends of the arch. So in uh, magenta here are the arch ribs in steel that come down and connect to um, a concrete substructure. Uh, and at this connection, we're looking at a side elevation here um, there are a number 48 in total of three inch diameter 
uh, pre-stressed anchor bolts to transfer um, the moments. So with minimal bracing here, uh, when the wind is, it blows on the structure, you get, you get some pretty big moments in the weak axis. And then under live load, you get some very large moments in the uh, strong axis and all that needs to be carried through and uh, you need to worry about fatigue. So you want to pre-stress all that together so that it doesn't uh, uplift at any point. And so the, the design looks uh, like this. This is a plan view here. There's a big steel base plate. Um, the magenta lines here are the outline of the arch box that lays down on that. And then each of these little dots here are the 48 three inch diameter anchor bolts that pass um, from the steel uh, into the concrete. So what we're looking at here is a big steel weldment. Um, the shiny stuff out the bottom is the stainless steel anchor bolts that we'll, we'll talk about. Um, all of this is embedded in the concrete. So the concrete comes up to the top here. This is on a truck. Um, but the steel arch comes and sits up top here. And these tubes are uh, where the anchor bolts pass through. Um, and then when, when they're done erecting the steel, when they've got the steel in place, they post tension um, the anchor bolts and then uh, grout them. And this is what it looks like after it's erected. You can see the shiny stainless steel sticking out the top. Um, and so the, the question came up with um, what materials were available uh, that we could use for these anchor bolts. They needed to be pre-stressed and they need to be stainless steel, sort of the two criteria, or at least corrosion resistant. And so there was a, um, a research project uh, instituted to identify some candidate materials and, and, and identify one uh, to carry these uh, large moments. And uh, because the moments are large, they needed to be pre-stressed to a fairly high level. Um, so it needed to have high yield strength, low relaxation, uh, and be corrosion resistant. Um, so what was uh, finally landed on is uh, a type 2507. Uh, it's uh, super duplex stainless steel. Oh, there we go, super duplex. Um, which is really amazing stuff. Uh, it met just about all the requirements, um, but it did have um, something of a low yield stress uh, when we finally um, were able to get the <clears throat> uh, material that would be used in the bridge tested. Uh, this is just a, a testing at some other laboratory somewhere else in the world. Uh, testing these uh, three inch bars to full strength. And you can see uh, beautiful, I mean, it's just beautiful material, lots of elongation, lots of ductility. Um, but uh, what we really was looking for for an 80 KSI bar and um, what we were getting was somewhat less. Um, so the solution, uh, this was pretty far along in design. We had already sort of sized all the connection for this. Um, to try and go back and, and do something different was going to be very difficult. Uh, so um, uh, Mr. Tim Stuffel in our office came up with uh, this solution, which um, because the material was so great and uh, had so much ductility, um, why don't we uh, strain harden it to increase the yield strength? Uh, we're giving up some ductility, uh, but we've got plenty to spare. Uh, and this is all pre-stressed. We don't expect it to ever see um, any loads beyond the pre-stressing load. And so that was what was done um, using the, the test data. We figured out uh, how, far, how long we had to pull it here, sort of strain hard it, to harden it to give us um, a yield strength above the required 80. Um, so it was done, this wasn't done beforehand, this was done during the construction of the bridge. So we had them um, install the arch ribs um, and then stress the bars to a, a high level and then relax them down. Um, and by that way, we strain hardened them in place uh, and uh, got the um, desired sort of idealized uh, behavior um, that would allow us to use these, these bars. Uh, and it all worked out uh, fairly well. Uh, so those were a couple of examples in design about how you kind of need to uh, be able to understand behavior, both material and structure, uh, to solve problems and to move forward. Uh, next we'll be talking for the sort of the rest of the lecture a bit about um, not examples in design, but examples when things um, maybe went a little bit wrong. Um, and then we'll talk about when they went a lot wrong. So this is um, the Liberty Bridge uh, right here in Pittsburgh. Uh, and that's a fire <laughs> and, and that's a lot of smoke. Um, and when you're in situations where you've got things going a little wrong, um, understanding behavior becomes even more important. Um, in basic structural and material uh, behavior understanding are really the keys to solving uh, some of these problems, especially when there's uh, a very tight time constraint, which there usually is when things go wrong. Um, so we'll talk about uh, Liberty Bridge Fire, but there are other projects we could talk about that tell a very, very similar tale. Uh, 
uh, which would include the, the Delaware River. So let's talk a little bit about um, the Liberty Bridge fire, and I'm going to get into the weeds in a couple of places here, so just bear with me. But it's a, a bridge, arch, uh, a truss bridge, sorry, crossing the Allegheny River, uh, Monongahela River. They don't let you in Pennsylvania unless you can pronounce Monongahela, by the way. Um, in Pittsburgh, uh, it was a, an existing bridge. It's been around for quite a long time. They were rehabilitating it, uh, replacing the deck. And uh, while that project was ongoing, while the construction was occurring, there was a fire that started on September 2nd, 2016. So a fair few years ago. Um, this is a screenshot of a video. Oh, wait a minute. There we go. There's the fire uh, and it's in progress. Um, it was some black uh, HDPE pipe that the contractor had stockpiled underneath the main structural elements, caught fire from some uh, steel cutting operations above. Uh, and burned with um, a pretty intense heat. Um, this is what the damage ended up looking like. This is the main compression member of the truss. Um, it's buckled, it's twisted, uh, in general in pretty bad shape. Um, most of the area of the web is in the webs of these uh, compression cords. Um, the, pred the webs and flanges were buckled and the angles lacing them all together. Um, the plan to repair all this was to jack uh, the structure back apart to try and straighten out uh, the existing steel in the webs and put some new angles on it and some new bracing uh, and call it good. Um, so the challenge uh, that uh, there were a number of people involved in this project, including Dr. Connor. Um, our role, uh, we were brought in by the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation to ensure that the jacking operations don't overload the other portions of the structure. That would not be good. Um, and then also to ensure that after they're all done with the repairs, um, the bridge is still going to be capable of carrying full traffic. And I'll explain why that was a concern here s shortly. And finally, to determine how much jacking was needed to restore the bridge to operation. Um, so the first thing, of course, you do is create a structural model uh, of this. So this is the bridge. Um, the element that was burned and buckled is over here. Um, here's a close-up of that. Uh, and uh, the reason why uh, we created a 3D model uh, is because uh, if you just try to analyze this in two dimensions, you get very different answers. Um, so looking at the, the dead load effect, this is without sort of the damage from the fire, but if you just look at the dead loads in the bridge during construction, um, the deck was removed from a, a, a large portion uh, of the bridge only on one side, which re uh, resulted in a very asymmetric loading of the bridge. Uh, and if you just did um, separate 2D analyses uh, of each truss line, um, you got these sorts of numbers. Um, so the east is a, sort of the far truss, the west is the near truss that was uh, buckled. Um, you still have a relatively um, similar load uh, in the key element. Um, but if you did a 3D analysis and you account for the torsional stiffness of the truss, um, then the load redistribution was, was rather different and there was a whole lot less load uh, in the element that, um, that buckles. Uh, another key um, question here was uh, how uh, impactful the deck behavior was to the overall uh, bridge behavior. Uh, the deck is composite with part of the structure. Um, it's a kind of a complicated deck system. I think it was the stringers it was composite with, but not the floor beams. And so there was some question of whether the deck was going to act compositely with the truss or not, or if there was enough flexibility in the floor system that um, the trusses would behave more like a non-composite system. And uh, the, the results were quite different. So these are stiffnesses uh, for sort of pushing on the truss where the member buckled. Uh, if you included the deck stiffness, you got about 1,100 kips per inch. Uh, if you didn't, it's about 460 kips per inch. Um, and these were important numbers for thinking about jacking uh, the truss and how much you have to jack it to put it back in place. Um, so that was a pretty big difference, and it was important to know which of those numbers was right uh, before we moved forward. And so um, we started looking at the lateral bracing and the sway bracing forces um, between the two models, and we saw a pretty significant difference between whether you assume the deck is composite or not. Um, and that allowed us to do a little bit of investigating to try and see if we could use uh, that fact that there was large differences in forces in these members to s figure out which is correct. So after the, um, the fire and the buckling of that main member, um, there was some significant damage noted um, in the sway bracing. So the sway bracing are sort of long, thin X-brace members, uh, sort of perpendicular to the direction of span um, that keeps the bridge nice and square. 
Uh, and uh, a number of these were noted as being buckled. Uh, so because it's in an axe, uh, any shear you put on those, one's going to go into compression and one's going to go into tension. Um, the one that goes into compression is going to elastically buckle because they're so long. Um, so by looking at field observations of uh, where um, the sway bracing was buckled and whether it was moderate or severe, we could compare it to uh, our um, predicted load divided by the um, elastic buckling load uh, for these different uh, members and whether it's composite or non-composite in the model. And so you could sort of start to correlate these fairly closely. So these are, um, if anything's over one, then it should be heading towards a, a buckled condition. The more greater than one, the more likely you're going to be able to see the buckling. And so we were able to correlate fairly well that, you know, the, the one with the worst uh, P over P crit number was one of the ones with the most severe buckling uh, for the composite model, and, whereas the non-composite model should not have buckled that. Uh, and they matched up pretty well, not, not in all cases, right? We, we have one here that we should have seen uh, more buckling that we didn't, and some down here um, that aren't quite matching up. But in general, um, it was uh, pointing toward the fact that the truss was acting compositely with the deck, um, which was a great help. Uh, and it complied with uh, what I'm calling Dr. Kalicki's law of analyzing existing structures. So Dr. Kalicki, Dr. John Kalicki was uh, my boss and my uh, predecessor in, in my position at m and &M. And uh, it was always his opinion that if you can uh, measure something, measure anything uh, in the actual structure so that you can relate it to what your model is telling you. Any verification that validates whether your model is correct or not is worth the time and effort. Um, so this approach of looking at the sway bracing um, was very helpful, gave us a lot of confidence anyway that we had sort of the right model moving into it. And so then we started looking at um, the truss with um, the buckled member. So this is a plan view. Looking down, what the colors indicate uh, where loads have gone. So anywhere there's red, that's either where the tension has increased or the compression has decreased. Anywhere there's blue, that means the compression has increased. And so you can see what happened here when the, both of these uh, cords are in compression under dead load. When uh, this compression cord buckled, um, the compression left this line and it went over to the other line. So the loads shifted from one side of the bridge to the other. Uh, and when you run the model and you look at some uh, uh, loads uh, pre and post, you can see where the loads shifted. So uh, the east, that's the really dark blue one over here, uh, went from about 2,600 kips in compression to about 4,600 kips. So a pretty significant shift. Uh, we also calculated then the dead load factor of safety, which is just the capacity divided by uh, the applied dead load. Um, and actually, the one that took the most load wasn't so bad, uh, but one, I think it was three up, uh, that was getting pretty close under just dead load to reaching its capacity. So we estimate about 2,000 kips moved from one truss to the other. Um, just because you, we could, uh, we did some uh, nonlinear modeling of the buckling event itself. Um, you can have a lot of fun here sort of modeling the decrease in yield and modulus elasticity with the increase in temperature and then what happens when um, when it buckles and then um, when you spray cold water on it, like the, the um, fire department came out and drove some really big fire trucks on the bridge, which is probably not a good idea, uh, and you know, put the fire out, um, but also uh, did some thermal things to the, to the to member here. Um, so the question that we were asked, um, can the truss be fully restored geometrically? And there was a bit of a debate going on um, about what happens when you buckle a member under high heat under compression. Uh, and when that member buckled and the web sort of kinked uh, and formed sort of localized plastic hinges where they bent in the different directions, um, they were under a lot of compression. And if you sort of work through a, a strain history of that, um, you can show that not only do you kink it um, when you form plastic hinges, but if you're under an axial load and it's compression, you also shorten it overall. So if all you do is straighten out the kinks, you're still going to end up with a member that's shorter than it was. Um, and uh, Lehigh University was involved, as, as, as well as Dr. Connor. And so, sort of, uh, as a summary of all the initial looks at this, was we're probably not going to be able to push this all the way back. Um, because in order to do that, we'd have to put a huge amount of tension on this member while we straightened it out, and that didn't seem realistic. Um, so, what effect would having an incomplete recovery have on the bridge? Uh, how much of the load would get shifted back? How much would it stay in its shifted condition, and is that okay? So that was sort of our charge. Um, so uh, we looked at then uh, in bridge engineering, um, when we're looking at an existing structure, we often talk in terms of ratings. Uh, 
uh, which is an evaluation of how much live load the bridge can carry compared to sort of its design live load. And so um, based on uh, the modeling stiffnesses, we've developed a whole bunch of ratings depending on how far they push that truss back into place. Um, so it, it, we think it moved, or we're pretty sure it moved about uh, inch and three quarter, inch and seven eighths um, when it buckled. So if they only push it back one inch, um, what does that give you? And then we had eighth of an inch increments after that full set of analysis models and figuring out what that means um, for the structure. Again, all based on the, the analysis model. Um, this is a, a shot of the jacking in operation. So there's Dr. Connor over here. And I think there he is there as well. Um, and so this was a, a kind of a full uh, effort for a whole bunch of people, uh, both do the jacking and then evaluate what's going on. This is our table here set up with um, Lehigh did the strain gauging. Um, we had um, some folks uh, running models essentially live uh, as we got the data in. Uh, and we're trying to figure out what the critical rating factor was as they jacked the bridge back. So every step of the jacking, they would stop and say, where are we? Well, well your worst, worst members rating this amount. And um, we we're also making sure that nothing weird was happening uh, as they were jacking back. All right, so here's where we're going to get into the weeds a little bit. I'll try and uh, keep it quick here. Uh, this is, I'm going to go through the process of, of how we took an FEA model uh, of the bridge, how we incorporated strain gauge results, uh, as well as measurements of the movement of the truss as they jacked it back into place, uh, to come up with an estimate of is the bridge safe for traffic or not. So you start with a, a finite element model and you can um, a push on that uh, where we're going to jack the bridge, right? You can push on that in the model and you can get um, a load deflection curve, nice and linear, because uh, the rest of the bridge is linear, um, and you get an initial stiffness, we're going to call that k naught, and we know that in order to get 1.88 inches, at least the model is predicting a certain change in force uh, due to the jacking. Um, of course, when they're actually jacking it, um, we're going to have uh, strain gauge data and uh, also some temperature data. I think Rob had his uh, infrared uh, thermometer, which is very helpful. And knowing those two things, you can then figure out what the change in force is from measurements only, not from the model. So a completely independent estimate of the force. Um, and then we were measuring the restoring displacement at the jacks as they jack them back. So we've got the predicted information here. We've got the actual measured data here. You can plot out that measured data. And of course, it's never going to fall exactly in a straight line. Uh, but you can take then um, the results here from the measured data and sort of back out uh, an, a stiffness, an effective stiffness uh, for the bridge as you jack it. You can look at um, an average stiffness as I showed. You can look at a localized stiffness between any two points. Uh, and you can compare those to your predicted stiffness um, from the model. So we've got this uh, K modified average or K modified between two points. Um, and then um, you can uh, estimate a change in load for any one member based on this K modified. If you have, um, uh, if that member happens to be instrumented, of course we have a whole bunch of uh, members that aren't instrumented. And so the rating factor there is going to defend, depend on is a function of the capacity of the dead load, the shift in load, the live load, and the impact. So for non-instrumented members, uh, we use the ratio of the modified sort of measured stiffness um, to the um, predicted stiffness times uh, our predicted um, force transfer. Uh, and all that was a rather complicated way of saying. We had all that set up in the spreadsheet ahead of time so that as the data came in, we could plot out here uh, versus uh, displacement, uh, what our rating was for all the critical members as they jacked. So this is a real-time show of your rating. You can see that one member was a negative 20, which you want to be positive in ratings. So it started out in a very bad location, but as they jacked, um, it moved along. And you can see at the end here, we did get above an HS20, uh, which, is, which was the goal for the bridge. Um, there was some uh, interesting artifacts here, as there always is when you're measuring something in the field. Um, so it, uh, the first day that this was going on, um, it was very sunny. Uh, you always expect some sort of shakedown uh, behavior to start with as sort of the instruments um, become engaged and the forces sort of settle down and you, you get the slop out of connections, things like that. Um, but we got a lot of really weird results to start with. Uh, and that was because the sun uh, was shining on one side of the bridge to start with and then later in the day it shined on the other. So the temperature, the east truss was hotter by about 10 degrees and then in the evening it flopped the other way. Um, and that really played havoc uh, with results from strain gauges. So luckily the second day was cloudy. Uh, 
uh, and the trusses were the same temperature pretty much the whole day. So that made it simple. Um, so uh, we, we were pretty sure that we wouldn't get quite to the inch and seven eighths, um, and that's in, indeed what happened. So uh, 1.88 is how much it moved, and it moved about 1.63 back. So not quite all the way, um, but it, we were able to um, advise the Pennsylvania Turnpike that the bridge would be safe, you could carry full traffic, there wouldn't be any long-term uh, problems from that. So some of the key aspects of behavior that came into uh, play for this project, right, ground truthing, um, predicted behavior to observed behavior. Uh, no, you know, having that comparison of where we expected some sway bracing to buckle versus where it actually did uh, gave us a lot of confidence uh, about which decisions to make and, and how you model it. Um, analyzing things in different ways, looking at predicted stiffnesses versus measured stiffnesses and comparing them um, helped a lot. Um, I have uh, jack pressures here. So there was a, a healthy debate about how much load uh, was really left in that buckled member. You know, we had our analyses that we had done, including the localized nonlinear analysis of the, of the buckling and the temperature time history of that, that sort of um, led us to a conclusion that there was essentially no load in that member. Um, but there were other folks um, from other places that thought, no, 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 there's, there might still be a lot of compression in that. Um, and uh, we sort of figured out as they were jacking uh, things apart, at some point, um, they stopped and they cut the uh, flanges that were all sort of buckled. Um, and that was a great opportunity because they're removing area. So uh, they were measuring jack pressures. Uh, and if the, um, let's see if I got this right. If the flanges were in tension and you cut them, if the member was in tension and you cut those flanges uh, off the compression member, the jack pressure will go down, right? Because you're pushing against tension in the member. So if you remove some of that tension, the jack pressure should go down. If there was compression in that uh, member when you cut them, then the jack pressure should go up because the stress that had been being carried by those flange angles will now go through the jacks. Um, so by sort of uh, staging where they, when they cut the flanges uh, and, measure, and uh, measuring what happens with the jack pressures, we were able to know that um, the member was in tension. And it can only have been in tension as if, if it started with essentially no load in it. If it had any significant compression, it still would have had it at the time they cut the flanges. So that was a good sort of, uh, we didn't plan that ahead of time. It was just sort of a, while you're sitting up there, um, way to, again, sort of confirm that what we had predicted was at least close to being right. Um, and then sort of knowing ahead of time that a less, complete, less than complete recovery of forces um, was likely uh, allowed us to plan for all that. Okay, so then uh, that was when some things go a little bit wrong, uh, but occasionally things go a lot wrong. Uh, and uh, we can talk a little bit about why understanding behavior is important um, to, to stop things from going very wrong, uh, but also to understand what happens when they do. Um, so that used to be a cable stay bridge. Uh, so uh, many of the bridge failures that have happened, or at least a few of them anyway, are a result of uh, the designer's really incorrect understanding of structural behavior. Um, and doing a failure investigation, you really, really pushes you to understand structural behavior and material behavior um, very well, uh, because uh, these are situations where things get pushed beyond the elastic range, um, start to activate all sorts of non-traditional load paths that you have to account for if you're trying to understand how it collapsed. So we'll talk about two examples here today, uh, the Chirahar Cable State Bridge Collapse in uh, Columbia, South America, and the FIU Pedestrian Bridge Collapse. And, I have to mention that uh, uh, Dr. Connor is responsible to some extent for m and being selected to do the uh, collapse investigation of Chirahara. I can give you details afterwards. Um, all right, so this is um, how the Chirahara Bridge uh, in Columbia looked like after the collapse. Um, the bridge was being cantilevered out from both sides to meet in the middle, uh, up a very steep gorge. Um, there's a tunnel right here that empties right down onto the bridge. There's another roadway up top. Uh, and after the collapse, one of the towers collapsed and the other remained standing for a little while. Um, this is the location. So this is uh, Colombia, South America. Here's uh, the Panama, Panama Canal. Uh, here is Bogota um, in the Andean mountain chain. And um, Villa Vicencio is a city um, just the other side of uh, the last uh, chain of the Andes. And the roadway goes from Bogota to Villa Vicencio. Um, and that's highlighted here, so that steep valley that I was mentioning is right here. Uh, the existing road is in yellow that goes up and around the valley and then back out. Um, here is where the new bridge was going to be. So you can see from this photo, here's the existing curved 
uh, steel bridge, uh, and then uh, this was the uh, Cable State Bridge. The project in general was, uh, this whole roadway was, it was a two-lane uh, roadway, um, and this was adding an additional two-lane roadway um, so that the, the two roadways would be separated in different bounds, so eastbound and westbound would be each on separate roads. And um, that bridge was going to be the final piece of that whole connection between those two towns. Um, this is an elevation view of the bridge um, as it's designed um, uh, to a pretty classic cable state bridge. Two main towers, um, very short side spans, which was uh, unusual. Uh, usually they're a bit better balanced than this. Uh, with short side spans, you're going to get a lot of uplift here, uh, a lot of force in your anchor cables. Um, the details, the anchorages were a little odd, uh, but for our purposes here, we're going to focus just on the towers. Um, so the towers were sort of a classic diamond shape, uh, a little narrow uh, compared to other bridges, uh, but this is not unusual. So you've got a, a vertical upper portion that anchors the cables, um, then the legs uh, splay out to go either side of the roadway that passes between them, and they come back down to minimize the size of the foundations um, at the bottom. Um, this bridge had a couple of uh, different kind of features. All of the um, tower is reinforced concrete. Um, there's an infill wall that becomes important here that uh, I think I also call the diaphragm. Um, there's a slab across the top uh, that I also call the crossbeam. Um, and then the tower legs, two legs top and bottom. There's a big caisson down here and a single caisson cap. Um, the anchorages up here were actually had steel uh, embedments in there to control the geometry. Uh, the superstructure was uh, steel edge girders with a cast in place concrete deck. Uh, this is a video, if you pay attention to the upper left, you'll see the um, tower um, on the day of the collapse. And if you pay close attention, you'll see the cable starting to come loose, and then it uh, comes down. And you can see there was a, um, there's some cables flying at the end. So after this, it was a hard and fast rule that I won't take on any uh, collapse investigations unless there's a video, because that helps out a lot when you start uh, looking into it. So the first thing that we did uh, was to do a frame-by-frame -frame analysis uh, of the video. So this is um, frame one uh, is more or less uh, before the collapse. You can see some of the cables are a little loose here. That's already things are starting to move. Um, if you pay attention here to the shadow uh, on the inside of the tower leg, so it's kind of hard to see, but below the deck, um, the two tower legs come down. There's an infill wall uh, between them, or a diaphragm. Um, but this is all in shadow here. Uh, if you go over to, let's say, frame four, you can see that there's now some light uh, in that location. So a pretty clear indication that something significant had changed there that now allowed light to go where it didn't used to go. Um, so that was one uh, key finding from an evaluation here. Um, the other, if you keep working your way along, the side span uh, was on temporary supports at this time, uh, and that seems to be in place uh, through almost the entire collapse sequence. The side span uh, is there. Uh, and the other reason why that's important is the side span is sitting on that infill wall, um, that diaphragm. So it isn't until oh, about here um, that the side span starts to, starts to collapse. Uh, the other thing to pay attention to is that it appears that um, the tower leg is getting wider. That diamond shape is widening out uh, as you go through the collapse sequence. Um, so as we get to this point, you can see the distance here is a whole lot greater than the distance there. So all of that was... Um, information that we had before we um, uh, traveled uh, down to Columbia and um, started to indicate maybe where the points of the most interest were uh, in the investigation. Uh, we did a plan review looking at uh, the details of the plan and calculating some simple uh, demand and capacity ratios. Um, here's the diamond shaped tower. There was the slab uh, that's shown here. There was some post tensioning that went through the slab uh, in that direction. There was also post tensioning in the other direction. Um, there was reinforcing steel, but the reinforcing steel was not continuous. There was a, a small, it was a bond breaker between this uh, slab or crossbeam uh, and the tower leg. Um, below, this is the diaphragm down here. There were number fours at eight inches in, in all directions, um, which is not a lot of steel, um, but it is a big tower. So it ends up being a lot of bars, um, but just not a very dense uh, situation. Uh, we looked at... Uh, you can, you know, just from the geometry, right, if you have a vertical force pushing down uh, on a diamond shape here where the um, compressive legs change direction, there's an outward thrust that happens that you have to restrain. And so you can look at that uh, slab 
uh, or a cross beam tying those two legs together and you can calculate a tension force in it. Uh, and when you did that and looked at the amount of post tensioning there, um, you found that the demand was about two and a half times uh, the post tensioning force, uh, which was um, a surprise. Um, but we thought about it a bit more and the, the best we could come up with was that um, the designer was maybe uh, assuming that all, this, uh, all these number four bars that run uh, across the diaphragm and anchor into the tower legs um, were there, could carry some tension force as well. Uh, and as it turns out, we, digging into the construction records, we found that this cross beam up here, the slab, was actually added after construction had started. It was not in the original design. Um, and it was really not intended as a tension tie. It was intended as a construction platform. Um, so that uh, answered some questions we had about why um, there wasn't a whole lot of post-tensioning there. Um, this is how uh, the scene looked when we got there. Um, the counterweights are up here near the tunnel entrance. Um, there's a, there was a transfer beam. Um, the foundation is here, sort of buried under some uh, collapsed structure, the side span superstructure. This is the top of the tower. Um, this is the tower head. This is the very top of the tower. Um, this is the base of that upper mast portion. Um, the lower leg on the south side, the upper leg on the south side. The same over here. The diaphragm ended up over here. Uh, here's the cross beam is over here. There's a big chunk missing here and then the rest of the superstructure was down the slope. This was a very steep area. Uh, I won't go into too much detail here. Um, but in looking at um, sort of the key pieces of evidence, uh, one was just trying to figure out where which piece was where. Uh, when you're standing in this mass of very large pieces of concrete that are all sort of rubbleized, it's hard to figure out what you're standing on a lot of times. Um, so it, it took a while to sort of figure out which piece was where. Um, but once you, you did that, you can, um, you can learn a lot from what ended up pretty far from where it started. The, the farther something ends up from where it starts in the collapse sequence, there's a pretty clear, a good indication that it, it maybe started failing early in the sequence. Um, some of the things we paid attention to, this, was a, this is the face of the lower tower leg. This is where that diaphragm wall connected to it. These are the number of fours at eight inches. Um, and you can see that uh, there's just a very little piece sticking out and they had fractured. It was a nice ductile fracture um, there, but th there, wasn't, there wasn't a lot of length sticking out uh, of the, the, the leg, which seemed to indicate that um, that bar had strained over a relatively short length. Um, looking at the tower leg that didn't collapse yet, um, we learned some important uh, pieces of information. So this is that cross beam, that slab. This is the tower leg, um, and there was a gap um, that had clearly opened up at some point between the two. Um, so that started to indicate that maybe that tower was spreading a little bit. Um, there's an elevator here, and that elevator is tied into the tower legs with some temporary supports, and they look here, and if you look real close, um, you can see that those are starting to pull out in sort of an anchor failure uh, from that. So that was another... Uh, Piece of inf we did not go on this deck. <laughs> we stayed back here uh, and took some pictures from far away. Um, but you know, a clear indication that uh, bad things were happening to that tower as well. Um, this is a look underneath the deck, again, from a safe distance. Um, and shown in yellow here, we drew in what is uh, clearly apparent a crack between the edge of the diaphragm and the tower leg that runs almost full height. Um, Clearly some early stage of failure uh, of that connection. Um. All right, so we did some analytical work, as you can imagine, um, to model the tower, We're including the construction of the tower, because that ended up being important uh, for why it failed asymmetrically. Um, if you don't model the tower construction and you just sort of have it uh, instantly appear and then you apply loads you get sort of a, a equal failure on both sides. But when you model the actual sequence that they did you, you find that um, failure starts more on one side than the other which follows with what we saw in the field. Um, and what you're seeing the red are cracks that form. Um, the model includes uh, a failure check of the rebar uh, that's in there. So um, we looked at a couple of different uh, ways to model that and uh, sort of the key here is uh, the length over which uh, you strain that rebar. Um, and that was a variable that we looked at. We also looked at the post-tensioning uh, that went through here. And again, um, the length over which uh, that gets strained um, as, it, as that crack opens is important. Uh, we had good information from the, the field review that those um, post-tensioning strands were behaved as unbonded for the full length. 
Um, we took some samples uh, from the PT strand from both sides of that slab after the collapse and tested them. And both of them showed evidence of strain hardening, um, similar to our previous discussion, which was a clear, clear indication that the full length of those post-tensioning strands had been taken into the inelastic range during the collapse sequence, um, which uh, bolstered the idea that <clears throat> they were unbonded. So when we modeled this, we modeled those post-tensioning strands as unbonded in terms of how much extra load they picked up during the failure. Uh, and then uh, we looked at a couple of different options here for the reinforcing steel. Uh, I think we ended up at about seven inches or slightly longer, the length over which that reinforcing steel um, was being strained at the crack. And that becomes important because uh, what happened here, um, I mentioned earlier that the designer was assuming that this infill wall would help resist the outward uh, thrust of the legs. Uh, and that, that's true, that does happen. Um, but all of that uh, tensile force concentrates at the very top of the wall. It doesn't distribute over the full length, length of the wall, uh, it's just at the very top. Uh, and so what <clears throat> ends up happening is, um, as those reinforcing steel yields and elongates, uh, it gets, gets to its fracture strain before the rest of the wall is engaged. So <clears throat> plotting then uh, in a couple of different ways here, <clears throat> looking at either stress with height or strain with height. Um, <clears throat> in orange is the results of uh, the finite element model, <clears throat> and in blue is what the designer assumed. So the designer essentially assumed that um, as that tower leg wanted to spread out, um, the full height of that wall would be engaged to keep the legs from moving, you know, assume the legs were essentially infinitely rigid and would sort of rotate across about their base and, and put all of that reinforcing steel in tension. That's the blue line. <clears throat> in both sides. But what actually happens uh, when you start to push the, um, the tower leg across at the middle uh, is that tower leg, even though it's, it's a massive chunk of concrete, um, is relatively flexible uh, in flexure compared to the in-plane stiffness of that diaphragm wall. Um, so that tower leg behaves as a very flexible portion of the structure and it just sort of curves near the top uh, or near the middle of the tower and you really only get uh, a little bit, maybe a third of the height of the wall <clears throat> engaged in tension. The rest of the reinforcing steel <clears throat> is actually in compression as you get on that wall. Um, so uh, we used a, um, a pile analogy. So this is a bit like um, <clears throat> a flexible pile in stiff soil or a stiff pile in flexible soil. Uh, this uh, relative stiffness of the tower leg in bending and the infill wall <clears throat> in uh, in-plane uh, behavior. And so the designer assumed he had a stiff pile and soft soil. They could push the pile and the pile would just, you know, sort of rotate and uh, engage all the soil. But what he really had was a flexible pile and stiff soil and he pushed on the pile and it was just the top of the pile that curved uh, and the rest of the pile was unengaged. And uh, we were um, scratching our heads on how to describe this. Um, the contracting situation here for the construction was rather complicated. Um, there was a P3 with a concessionaire, um, and we were engaged by the P3 um, to sort of uh, find the reason for the collapse so that we could advise them on what they should do next. Um, so we had a, a, a lot of people, some of which were not engineers, that we had to explain this rather complicated behavior issue to. Uh, so we came up with a, a relatively simple model. So this is, a, there are springs in here. Um, on this side is a very thin piece of aluminum that um, proportionally is uh, correct for that size of that reinforced concrete and the stiffness in plane of that diaphragm. On the other side is a big thick piece of steel connected to uh, a similar set of springs over on this side. So you could pull on uh, the flexible piece of aluminum and you can see it just sort of curves at the top and the rest of it is held tight up against um, the, the plastic here. If you flip it around and do the same to that rigid piece of steel, of course the whole piece of steel pulls out, rotates about its bottom and activates all the springs. Um, so this was a good way to sort of, physically you can pass the model around. We had a little digital scale and said, hey, you know, pull to a certain force and see how different the displacements are. Um, Showing that the stiffnesses were different uh, and it, it was a good way to, you can actually, you know, feel when you're pulling on it and you can see all the displacement concentrated at the top. Uh, so that helped well, it helped explain. So the conclusions uh, was that the designer was relying on this diaphragm wall to be fully active, full height. Um, that was highly unusual. I'm not aware of any other cable stay bridge that has that feature. Uh, 
Um, there were another other there were a bunch of other aspects of the design that were highly unusual. Um, he didn't check compatibility between the tower leg deflections, so didn't ask the question. In order to activate this full load path, what needs to happen, and is the rest of the structure compatible about with that? So uh, the sequence was. Um, the, I should mention the tower that didn't collapse was one construction stage behind the one that did. So these are constructed by placing segments of steel out and then putting a cable on and casting the concrete. And they do that alternating between the two towers. And they had just cast uh, the deck on the tower that collapsed on a Friday. It collapsed on a Monday. Uh, and they were about to cast the next section on the, the leg that didn't collapse. Um, so what happened was um, after they cast that final section of deck on the tower that collapsed, um, the loads in the tower went up. Um, the cracking got larger. Um, they went home for the weekend and due to creep, loads got redistributed. Additional load gets thrown into the reinforcing steel as the concrete creeps in tension. Um, and by Monday there was enough so that um, the upper couple of bars started to fracture. Um, as they fractured, they released a load, there was more displacement, which strained the next sets of bars down, and then you had an unzipping failure as it went down. The post-tensioning failed relatively late, but again, there wasn't a lot of it, so it wasn't able to pick up the load. And it was fully unbonded, so it just elongated. <laughs> so a classic unzipping failure. Um, this is what happened to the other tower. Um, the contractor was suggesting that maybe they could just strengthen it uh, and rebuild the one that collapsed, but um, uh, we recommend that they do this. Um, so I, I, and I think the, f the failure of this one looked a lot like uh, the previous one with the tower leg opening and, uh, whoops, cables flying all over the place. All right, so some conclusions. Yeah, I meant past that, okay. So some of the key aspects for, in terms of behavior uh, for the chair harbor bridge, um, you know, assuming a distribution of load that's not consistent with stiffness, right? You assume that the tower legs would act as very stiff and activate the full height of the diaphragm. That didn't happen. Um, a significant departure from past design practice. Um, most every other cable stayed bridge has a tension tie right across the center of the tower that's post-tension to carry the full load. Um, this designer chose to do something different, never verified it. Um, there was a disconnection between their analysis models they used, um, the assumptions that they made in the design, so they never actually modeled the tower um, like that. They never even did a linear elastic model to figure out uh, where the loads concentrate. And then um, their design assumption, how the bridge actually behaved. There was you know, four different things there, or three different things. Uh, okay, so uh, we'll move on to the um, last one here, which is the FIU bridge collapse, uh, pedestrian bridge collapse in Florida. Uh, it occurred on March 15th, 2018. Um, it occurred when they were adding post-tensioning that had been removed previously. Uh, that was not part of the original construction sequence. Uh, the bridge was highly unusual. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with it, but maybe we'll cover some aspects that are a little different. Um, so it was a concrete truss, um, single plane of truss. It had a tower that was going to be added and some stays um, that were really there just to look nice. Um, they were pipe stays, not cables. Um, incidentally, they did have to be designed for live load because even though they're there for just looks, they do have stiffness and they would pick up load. Um, so it was a bit of a mishmash of a design here. Uh, I'm sure you've seen this, but we'll go through it. So this is what happened on that uh, March day. Uh, the bridge had been moved into place. You can see the crane for the post-tensioning operation, and that's when it collapsed. Um, yeah. Uh, so the failure that precipitated the collapse, it was pretty straightforward. Um, a connection at one of the truss members, the diagonal, failed in shear. Um, because it was a single truss, there was no alternate load path. There, it was uh, the very definition of non-redundant. Uh, once that connection failed, um, the collapse occurred. So the things to pay attention to here, um, this was the end vertical. Here's the end diagonal. There's the end of the deck. So pretty clear that this, which used to be connected to that, um, separated out. The, the rest of the structure, uh, you know, collapsed and, and rubbleized here to a large extent, but everything else was more or less connected where it, it started. Um, this was the only connection that ended up quite so far apart. So this was the sequence. Um, there was some post-tensioning in here that was temporary during construction. This was picked up and moved into place as part of an ABC situation. So in, in its final condition, this diagonal is in compression, but in the uh, transportation condition, this is in tension. That's why the post-tensioning was there. 
So the post-tensioning um, had been there, uh, it had been removed, um, there was cracking, uh, and the decision was made to add the post-tensioning back, even though this diagonal was already in a significant amount of compression. Um, so this was the sequence that happened. Uh, it went through, you got a shear failure here that had been starting, it had grown uh, through the back wall, um, disconnected that diagonal, uh, now there was no shear path anymore, uh, that shifted out, uh, the rest of the structure fell down, uh, and because um, this point got a lot closer to that point, um, the, or this point and that point, the post-tensioning ends up sticking out um, in the collapsed state. So shear friction, um, that's a pretty standard design failure mode that we look at, right? Ashto covers it quite well. Um, capacities are directly expressed in Ashto. Um, the designer looked at shear friction, they designed for shear friction, um, but they used analysis results that were off by almost a factor of two. Um, they used multiple models uh, to design this bridge from very simple truss models to highly complex 3D FEA solid element models. Um, and the results they pulled were from the complex model. So they were using a 3D finite element solid element model of a truss. And they were, in order to get the shears at these locations, they were using a slicing function in the finite element analysis that um, integrates the stresses over all the elements to give you a total force. Um, but they were doing that incorrectly. There was an issue with the software, but they were aware of it. Um, anyway, this was the result. So uh, if you did a, just a 2D shear demand uh, model uh, of a truss, right, uh, you'd get numbers like this. And these are the numbers in orange. Um, this is the result of, of the three-dimensional uh, model that they used. Uh, and those are the numbers in blue. And so uh, this is the member that uh, collapsed, if I got that right. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, that one. Um, and it was a combination of, uh, as you'll notice, that the difference here wasn't the largest, right? That, that one's a whole lot worse. Um, but that was the one that had the smallest capacity when compared to um, the loading. So that was one aspect of it, a straight up design error. They, they had the wrong load, they incorrectly used a model, and they didn't check it. Um, but there was a, another aspect of this collapse that I think is equally important. Um, especially when you're starting out in your career. And that was the cracking at this location was noted very early in the design, or in the construction. Uh, while it was still in the yard before they moved it out, before it was under any significant load, um, there was already some small cracking that's starting to show up. Uh, the contractor contacted the designer, hey, we got some cracks. Designer said, don't worry, not a cause for concern. Um, so then they started to move the bridge around um, and the cracking got worse. Uh, it's not clear how, um, what photos eventually ended up with the, the designer, but the, the designer said, no, it's fine, keep going. Um, and then the cracking got really bad. Um, and people started getting very worried. And the designer said, well, hey, why don't you go and reapply that post-tensioning to add more compression in that member uh, that we had removed? It's not clear why they said that. Um, this was the condition of the structure in the morning of the collapse. Um, this is the member that eventually fails. There's the shear plane that's going to fail. Um, this little sh uh, uh, chamfer here is attached to the deck and the gap you're seeing there is this member sliding that way uh, you know by where are we at here almost uh, three-quarters of an inch maybe more um, this is the damage to the side of the member as it's sliding I think you've seen these photos right this is um, a rule that someone stuck in that's I think the six inch mark so that's a six inch deep crack um, that's uh, hard to see but for maybe five inches uh, this is the back side so that the diagonal member is pushing in here this is the slab and it's blowing out the back of the slab. So this is, um, you know, this is a, a, a bridge under load over traffic um, that's displaying um, the amount of damage that would probably not be allowed in a laboratory specimen during testing. Right. Um, so there was a chance to prevent the collapse. Um, the uh, designer um, was out there. I think one of the photos there showed his arm. Um, he visually examined, saw the cracking, saw the movement. Um, went to a meeting, um, took no action to do anything, continued with the post-tensioning operation that was going to add load to this joint, um, and then suggested that they didn't need to shore the bridge. And then the bridge collapsed when they applied that additional load to the member. Um, so some key aspects of behavior here from uh, Florida International. Um, hey, multiple models is great. Uh, complicated models and simple models of the same structure are great. Um, but you do have to compare the results. Uh, it, for them to be useful. Uh, mixing models can be problematic. They took some loads from one model and other loads from a different model and mixed them and they ended up unconservatively comparing, uh, in combining loads. Um, simple models can provide results that are more than accurate enough, especially if you're talking about trust dead loads. Uh, 
Um, you don't need a 3D solid element FEA to know what the dead load is in a truss member, um, you know, if it's a normal truss. Um, and then the other uh, point here, if you fall in behind the structure, uh, stop and reassess. So um, hopefully uh, most engineers never come into this situation, uh, but if there's ever a time when a structure is doing something you don't understand, um, that's not the time to say, oh, I'm sure it'll be fine. Uh, that's the time to get very worried. All right, when things start behaving as if, as you don't expect, um, you need to pay very close attention. Uh, and if there's ever a potential for a safety issue, then that's the time to take extra precaution, even if it means, um, you know, potential negative consequences for yourself. Um, it, when things start happening on a structure and you don't understand and they start getting ahead of where you are, where your brain is, uh, then that should be a red flag to you um, that something needs to change. So, um, going through all of those, sort of ending on a, a downer note there, uh, but uh, how do you become a structural behavior? So, after we've gone through all that, right? Um, sort of what I was um, starting to talk about at the beginning, um, it's really your responsibility to understand what the structure is doing and, and why it's behaving in that way, right? You can't pass that off onto a piece of software or a set of standard plans. Hey, I just used the standard plans, it should be fine. Um, no, that's your responsibility. Um, and wishful thinking really doesn't have a place uh, when things aren't going uh, the way you think they should. So make sure your structure can sustain the displacements or strains um, that it needs to find a load path. A lot of times in design, um, when things get sort of complicated, we make sure, hey, as long as we've got a load path that has enough capacity to carry the loads, then we feel better about it. Uh, but the caveat is make sure that that structure has the ductility to find that load path. Um, analysis can be part of the problem or part of the solution. That's sort of up to you and how you use it. Um, uh, Dr. Phil Ritchie likes to say, I think he stole this from uh, an, an economist, uh, all models are wrong, some are useful. Um, there's rarely a single exact right answer for any structural engineering question about loads. Um, all results are approximate, um, just to different degrees of accuracy. So. Uh, identify what degree of accuracy you need and then use uh, an appropriate analysis model. Um, if the model provides insight into the behavior that you're interested in, then it's a useful model uh, and go ahead and use it. Um, finally, uh, approximate methods uh, that used to be the only method for analyzing structures mm -hmm. are, are still around and they can be invaluable uh, when you get into a situation where you've got a complex model and you don't quite sure it's giving you the right answer. Um, don't be afraid to go back to some simplified approaches. If you have a frame system, then the portal approach where you assume hinges are halfway up the columns is a great way to give you some, at least a, a, a touchstone. And remember that the real analysis is done in your brain, right? So you, you've got a model, you've got some software that's running, that's great. Uh, but that's just there to help you uh, understand what's going on. Um, you can't, uh, can't shift that over. So uh, some other advice, you know, always be curious. Why is it deflecting like that? Whether it's a model or the actual structure. Where's the load going? Do I, do I understand where that load's going? Um, you know, it really is a zero sum game. If there's a load applied, it's gotta go somewhere. Uh, it can't disappear. Um, so make sure that you know where it's going or at least have provided a load path for it. Um, another question to ask, uh, what happens if the load increases? So if I've designed a structure um, that uh, I calculate have enough, has enough capacity, but I know that my failure mode's gonna be very brittle. Um, you know, you may not be completely accurate in your analysis. Your estimation of the loads might not be exactly right. Um, so it's always good to have a little excess ductility and capacity uh, in your designs. Uh, how do I know if the forces are right? Uh, the software is telling me this. It looks great. Uh, but how do I know? What, what else can I do to make sure I've got the right um, solution there? Can the structure activate the load path I've provided for it? There's enough capacity there, but the loads have got to get there. Um, and is there another way to analyze the structure to verify the results, right? Is there some other way I can do it to give myself confidence that I've got the right answer? Uh, so with that, I, I'd like to go through, um, as I mentioned, the, all of, the, all of uh, what I presented here is based on the work of a lot of people. Um, so uh, let's see, the first two columns are all uh, Majeski and Masters folks. Um, Dr. John Clicky, my former uh, boss, uh, a bunch of other folks. Um, not sure there's any Purdue grads in there at this point. Uh, and then over on the right is some, some other folks um, that we work with, Tom Asiosi at, at PennDOT um, and Dr. Connor. Uh, we worked with on a, a number of these projects as well as some other folks. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity. We went a little long. I apologize for that. Uh, and I'd like to thank again Dennis Drag for, uh, for putting this lecture series on. And uh, be happy to take any questions. <laughs>